uh, uh, what I'm here to talk about today is is interest rates because I'm uh, I'm a little bit odd in that I'm a person who's gone back and tracked interest rates for the last five thousand years. Now, I mean, I haven't I haven't tracked them for five thousand years, but I've tracked the rates over the last five thousand years because I believe interest rates are are a very good predictor of history. And what I wanted to kind of point out today was a few anomalies that we have going on with interest rates. My main one being the main thing I'm going to, I'm going to talk about is that real rates, which would be the rate of interest, the prevailing rate of interest. Um, minus the inflation rate, real rates are lower than they've ever been in recorded history, way lower than they've ever been in recorded history. And that has, that has a lot of, there are a lot of things that go along with that, that everyone needs to be thinking about in terms of uh, investing, what types of investment to have, what to hold and for how long. I think we're in a really unique period that is that is unmatched. And as an investor, um, people need to be thinking in a more lateral way than they used to. Things are not, I don't believe, going to work the way they used to. Uh, and I believe you need to be more, if I can just put it into one word, nimble. Well, nimble and open-minded. And so uh, I just, I've got a a uh, few slides here that I'm going to go over today, more than a few, about 50. That would be an airplane going over my house. I apologize. I live right next to the Augusta National Golf Course, and everybody's always flying in to play the golf course. And, and it's the type of people who decide what the interest rates are in the world. Anyway, so everybody's always throwing statistics at us. And there's a site that I like to look at, and it's called Shadow Stats. And it, it shows... It, what it does is it takes official rates, um, you know, unemployment, inflation, things like that, and then goes back and calculates them like they used to be calculated back in the 80s. And so uh, this, this graph is from Shadow Stats. And what it shows you is that, you know, right now people say, oh, the, the unemployment rate is 5%. No, it's really not. The real unemployment rate, which includes people who have just stopped looking for work, is really more around 25%. And that's a sign of, of fragility in the economy that people need to be looking out for. And it just intuitively feels as though that is the right number. I mean, a 5% unemployment rate right now, if, if the employment rate was that right now, we wouldn't be having all these supply chain disruptions, which are caused exactly by not having enough people to work, to fill those positions. So there are probably enough positions to support a 5% unemployment rate, but that's not what the rate is right now. And my main point in all this is to, to try and get all of y'all, like I said, to look laterally at the numbers and, and be a little bit more nimble in your thinking. Uh, this is uh, from the Federal Reserve. Fred is Federal Reserve Economics Department, I believe is what it stands for. And this is interesting to me, this first, first chart, it's total checkable deposits, sort of what we used to call M1. And you can see that checkable deposits starting with the pandemic have gone straight up. People have lots of money in their checking accounts. Is that a good idea? I'm not sure, but people are scared. And so they're putting money there. One thing that I find is interesting, we've all heard about the Federal Reserve printing a lot of money. One thing I find is interesting is that you can sort of see this straight up, these are um, how many $1 bills are in circulation. And you can see it pretty much goes up at 45 degrees. Look at, this is the, the number of $20 bills. All right, all of a sudden, people are using and saving a lot of $20 bills, and these are $100 bills in circulation. So you can see the measures of cash are being, cash is being used for saving now, it would appear, more than transactions, which, you know, it's has been as historical use. And one thing that really, um, stresses this is something called the velocity of money. Uh, this is a chart of the velocity of M1, which is checkable deposits plus 
money. And like I said, it's a measure that's really not used anymore, but it's, it's extremely valuable to look at what this chart says. What this, what velocity of money is, is how often money is being turned over. Like if you're a dentist and then you, you earn a dollar and you pay that dollar to the grocer and the grocer then pays that dollar to somebody at the gas station who then pays that dollar to their insurance agent. That's velocity of money when they're doing it a lot. Uh, when money is not moving, the velocity of money is low. And you can see uh, by this chart that the velocity of money is the lowest that it's ever been. Money is not being used. It's being, for lack of a better word, hoarded and not being put into uh, the economy, which is a very, very worrisome thing. So we need for that velocity of money to speed up. This is the European Central Bank's balance sheet. And I was talking about cash in existence and people printing money. And people talk about the Fed printing money, which I'm going to talk about in a little while. But this is the European Central Bank, which in general follows the Fed. But if you look at 2015, you can see that their, um, their balance sheet was about $2 trillion. And right now, their balance sheet is $8 trillion. So they've increased essentially the amount of money uh, in their economy fourfold, which is absolutely inflationary. A classical definition of inflation is an increase in the money supply. And this, what you're looking at right there, is an increase in the money supply. That's a very Austrian Frederick von Hayek definition but it's the oldest of old school definitions. Inflation is an increase in the money supply. And when you increase the money supply, the amount of goods in the economy is still the same, but the number of people chase, the amount of money chasing those goods is there's more of it, which it completely explains the 30% rise in real estate in our economy over the last year and a half, because that almost completely mimics the rise in the money supply. Uh, this is a, a chart which basically shows the Wilshire 5000, a stock index divided by our GDP ratio. And you can see that it's higher than it's ever been and very, very high above the mean. And I don't know much, but I do know that things always return to the mean. But what that means in one sense is that stocks are historically overvalued but what it also shows, if you look when it starts, is, is it starts about when we really started printing a lot of money. Actually, 1973 is when we really started printing a lot of money. But in the last couple of years, we really, really have. And it's only had two places to go, real estate or stocks. And so it's made stocks uh, way more expensive historically relative to our gross national product than it probably should be. The same for precious metals. This is just a, a, a chart that points out the increase in the number of contracts in the precious metals world. And you can see they've really increased as people have fled uh, to gold and silver and some other metals like palladium. What my overall, the thing I'm trying to make clear is that we are in the middle of printing a lot of money right now. And that money has to go somewhere. We have a lot of liquidity. And the worst place that money can be right now is cash. I'll tell you all why in a minute. I wanted to point out one other thing too, which people don't really read. Uh, people like me read, but this is the Office of the Control of the Conser Currency Reports on derivatives. And I'm sure most of y'all have heard about what derivatives are. And in its simplest case, if you buy an option on a stock, that's a derivative. But what big banks do is trade derivatives amongst each other all the time to, uh, as, a, as a profit center. And what's a little bit worrisome about that is, let me pop to the next page, is if you look at the largest uh, banks in the United States, okay, I'm going to give you a couple of numbers. Our economy is about $17 trillion per year. World GDP, the world economy, is about $70 trillion a year. And if you look at the top five banks uh, in the United States, you see that JP Morgan alone has $3 trillion in assets, the bank does. 
but they're holding $46 trillion in derivatives. All right, so that's, I don't know, 14 times their net worth. They have an extremely risky assets. And that $46 trillion just at JP Morgan Chase is also roughly three times the United States gross national product. We have a very, very financialized economy and it's something to be extremely wary of. And that's my point in saying that we need to be thinking laterally about things that you don't think can happen, but do sort of like Bear Stearns. Nobody ever thought Bear Stearns could uh, go belly up until they did. In fact, the week before Bear Stearns went belly up, Jim Cramer was on CNBC saying, you got to buy this stock. It can't go belly up and then it goes belly up. So I would just encourage everybody to be aware of the amount of uh, derivatives out in the economy because globally it totals about $300 trillion, which is five times uh, world GDP. So if somebody defaulted on one derivative, we could have a repeat of what happened in 2008, where those things just sort of cascade amongst themselves. All right, inflation. Like I said, to me, inflation is, is both a product of and the cause of a, an increase in the money supply. And you've all seen it when you've been to the store lately. This is one of the best ways to look at it. This is the unit. Uh, this is how much a can of Campbell's soup costs. And if you, you see in 19... 75, 73, 75, which is about when we were, well, in 71, 72, we went off the gold standard and into fiat money, which is money that is printed. And you can see that a can of Campbell's soup was 10 cents and a can of Campbell's soup now, that same can is a dollar. So essentially what that clearly shows is that your money is worth 10% uh, of what it was in 1970. Inflation is a hidden tax, and the only people that benefit from it are the people who have debt and the people who hold assets. It's beneficial to the people who have debt because it decreases the value of the debt. If you have $100 in debt and we have 10% inflation, next year, you really only have $90 worth of debt. Uh, it's, it's an absolute tax, and it, but if you hold assets during an inflationary time, that, like real estate, those assets go up. So you, uh, you benefit from that. Uh, the fellow back at Shadow Stats uh, seems to think the nominal inflation rate, we're told, is around 4 to 5%. He seems to think it's about 8 to 9%. I believe inflation right now is actually running more about 20%. And it's happened before. But if you just in the, in the real inflation statistics, they don't typically include food. They include iPhones and things like that. And they'll include certain types of food, but not the food people eat. And they really don't include energy. And, and so let me show you all in terms of things that cost money, how much they've gone up. This is uh, in one year, you can see if you go over to where you see the little green bar, you can see lean hogs. So let's, let's just say bacon. Bacon's up 105%. Corn is up 76%. Uh, soybeans are up 64%. Soybean oil's up 109%. That's inflation. Well, people can say, well, Ron, you know, my iPad is, was $400 last year and it's, you know, $390 this year. That's not inflationary and you're right, but you can't eat an iPad. And, and, but we do have deflation in certain goods like computers that are driving things down. And those are the kind of statistics that are overcounted when determining what the inflation rate are is, is, is the things that are deflationary. And we do have a battle going on between deflation uh, in things that aren't complete, completely necessary for life and inflation in things that are necessary for life, like food and energy. Uh, this is the three-year uh, chart. You can see in, over the last three years, the one I wanted you to really look at is uh, soybeans are up 70% over the last three years. And if you go to the bottom, coffee's up 66%. And it's actually going to be up even more in the next quarter or so uh, because we had... Uh, 
a bad harvest down in Brazil. And oats, you can see over the last five years are up 173%. Rice, which is the staple food around the world is up 40%. That is inflation, all right? And you need to be thinking about that. There's also inflation in energy because every business like hospitals require energy requires energy to run and that's reflected in all their costs. And you can see that in one year, oil is up 57%. We can sort of see that, but natural gas is up 400% in one year. A friend of mine lives in Berlin, Germany. And at this very moment, electricity is 500% more than it was a month ago. Okay, inflation's here and it's going to stay here for a while. This is the cost of uh, civilian workers, it's up. Uh, crude oil production is in the United States has gone down, but as we recover um, out of the pandemic, use is gonna go up. So because there's less of a supply, that's going to force uh, the cost up. And we have a lot of people over here that have started to drill wells, but not finish them. And that's why you see the line going down. So our energy supply is going to be less and we're going to have another inflationary sort of uh, attacks in terms of uh, the cost of companies uh, having to buy carbon credits to offset their, their carbon usage. And those carbon credits have gone, you know, they've, they've essentially quadrupled uh, over the last year. And mathematically, they're set to go way, way, way higher. I think there could be a huge short squeeze in that. And, um, and in terms of portfolios, that's something everybody needs to be thinking about is, is working uh, that asset class, carbon, uh, into your investing. That's the price of oranges, they're up. Price of uh, coffee, I told you, is up. Uh, this is the price of bacon, way up, which is super unfortunate. This is from the USDA food plans. If you look down, I'll go ahead and tell you, it's, this is a busy chart. Uh, it essentially costs about $1,000 to feed a family of four on a, per month on a moderate uh, food plan. That's double what it was uh, three years ago. So to feed a family is, is double what it was. Older folks, this chart shows you expect inflation to be higher than younger folks, but I think we all now have uh, snapped into a Slim Jim in the fact that inflation is really high. And where it's really evident is when you go buy ground beef at the store. I don't know if you've seen it, but I, I was at the store the other day and people were just staring at the meat counter in disbelief at how much prices have gone up. That's inflation, it's here. I mentioned it before, the purchasing power of your dollar is going down. So it's a bad idea, I believe, to have cash because inflation's higher really than it's ever been, which means that it's gonna be eating away at your cash faster than it has ever done. And in the meantime, the Fed is still, although we hear about a taper, they're still printing money at a huge, huge pace, which is, as I've tried to explain, very inflationary. We've had transitory inflationary periods in the past, and that was really uh, during World War II, all right, when that sort of had to happen. But we've really hadn't had anything like this since uh, the late 70s. And what that does is that all comes to bear on, on interest rates, which are the lifeblood of money and business. They essentially determine everything. And here is my big... 3,000 year chart of interest rates. And if you go all the way back, you can see on the, uh, on the X axis, this goes back to 3000 BC, when you saw interest rates were 20%. And back in those days, you could literally take a, uh, a loan out on a horse to do work or a cow or, or something like that. I mean, but interest rates did exist. You don't think of them existing that far in the past, but they did. But if you kind of look at an average, if you just eyeball an average of what's going on, you can see that that interest rates are really around 4% until you get to about 1965. And in 1970, you know, we went off the gold standard and went on to being able to print money. 
and inflation skyrocketed up to um, back then it was it was probably 14 percent and Paul Volcker came in and to tamp inflation down uh, he raised interest rates when I got into the business of money oh uh, lord 38 years ago I believe it was maybe a little bit longer ago you could get a treasury bond, a 30-year treasury bond that yielded 18%. You get that now and it yields 1%. Times have changed. But if you look at that chart over 3,000 years, except for the period during the Great Depression, you can see that interest rates are lower than they've ever been. And even given the depression interest rates, we didn't have the inflation we have now. So if you count inflation into that, the real rate is very, very negative, which has never happened before. This chart, again, what I'm trying to give you is a sort of a longer look at where interest rates hover. Usually it's around 4%, all right, over the long term. Uh, these are three months treasury bills. You can see in 1980, uh, when Volcker raised uh, rates, uh, they got up, this is the three month, they got up above 15% and since then has been on just a huge collapse, down, collapse downwards, except for 2008 when it went up to 2.5%. Um, once again, this is closer. This is just simply from 1990. But you can see from 1990, rates have just, have just collapsed. One interesting thing I find about from where I get all these statistics, which is the Federal Reserve, is which uh, which measures they've decided to stop reporting, all right? They've discontinued. This is a list of all the things they no longer report. And most of them have to do with the balance sheet of banks, which I, I find super curious. This is the net interest margin for banks. That's how banks make their money. And their net interest margin is lower now than it's ever been. And one could take the position that banks really don't make money loaning money out anymore they make it on transactional costs uh you know atms servicing costs things like that and and buying from the fed window just buying you know borrowing at one rate and then buying treasuries from the other and taking the spread banks are not in the business these are high quality bonds uh banks don't seem to be in the business of loaning anymore these uh bonds once again you can see that the 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 rate has just crashed. And that's Volcker you see with the peak and then they crash after that. Um, this is commercial paper, which, which has just absolutely collapsed. So interest rates, my point obviously, is that interest rates have gone down. And if you look at it on in an historic sense, they're lower than they've been in history. Uh, in Germany right now, which I mentioned a little while ago about inflation, uh, banks have told customers, go ahead and take your money somewhere else because they're having last year customers, if you look down at the bottom, um, customers had to pay to have their money in the bank. They didn't get interest, they had to pay interest. Uh, rates, negative rates have become common over in Europe. That's Christine Lagarde, who's the president of the European Central Bank. Uh, so what we have, uh, as this person mentions, is a toxic mix of negative interest rates and high inflation. And it's incurring everywhere in all these countries. What's, what's crazy is in Sweden right now, if you take out a mortgage, uh, the bank pays you, the, you pay the principal, but the bank pays you the interest because the rate is negative, all right? So $16 trillion of debt, which is the same amount as the, um, as, as the United States gross domestic product, is yielding negative right now. That's never ever happened before. These are the real rates of, of German bonds. Uh, if you look, the real rates, which is the, the rate of interest that's being paid minus inflation is minus 4%. My point is, my two big points are holding cash is dangerous right now because it's going to be worth less next year than it is right now. It's just going to be worth less. Uh, the only thing that benefits, it's not cash. The only thing that benefits is, is owning debt or 
um, owning assets that appreciate along with inflation. But what these interest rates are is an indicator. Like I said, I look at them as a leading indicator. They're an indicator that something is amiss in the system. And that means we just need to be super careful uh, with our savings, with our money. The Chinese have a saying, money is life. And, and in closing, what I would tell you to do is, is yes, money is, is life. I look at, uh, in fact, Scott and I had a discussion the other day about how money is literally freedom. So you have to be careful with your money because you're just not tending to your money, you're tending to your freedom. So you have to be extremely careful right now where you allocate your assets because never before in history have we had rates this low or inflation this high. Take a look at those two factors and uh, act accordingly.